In this lesson, we will discuss how we can use Grasshopper to move data between Rhino and Revit. Obviously, there are many different ways to do this, so I'll show you a few different methods and discuss some of the benefits and limitations of each of them. To introduce myself, my name is Joshua Stellini. I am an architect, BIM manager, and computational designer with nearly 10 years of industry experience. I have a Revit model here, which is the Revit sample model. To download the template files for this lesson, you can sign up for a free account on our website, thedifferentdesign.com, and follow the link below. So let's start with extracting Revit geometry to Rhino. The easiest way to get Revit geometry into Rhino is to pick the elements directly. So let's go ahead and do that. In the Param tab, under the Revit tab, we have a series of input components. For example, we can grab some walls directly using the wall component. This wall now lives in Grasshopper. Simply right clicking and baking this component will bring the geometry into Rhino. Rhino Inside also produces a layer structure when baking Revit elements, grouping elements by their category. The geometry often comes in as blocks, but it is native Rhino geometry and is fully editable within the Rhino environment. Let's say we want to include multiple categories. For instance, in addition to the walls, I want to include this roof as well. I can't use this component anymore because it won't allow me to select the roof category as it is limited to selecting the walls. Well, to get around this, there's a catch-all input called the graphical element. This will allow you to select any object in Revit, regardless of its category. Clicking on this, selecting multiple graphical elements, I can now select both the wall and the roof. I might decide to include these windows as well. If we bake it, you can see that Rhino creates separate layers for each category, and for the case of the windows, sublayers for their subcategory elements such as the frame, glazing, and so on. Okay, great, but what if we want to be a bit more targeted in our selection? For example, what if we wanted to select all of the floors in this project and not have to click on them one by one to reference them? Well, this is where queries and filters come into play. Query components are denoted by green icons, and most of them are found under the filter toolbar in Revit. So, what is a query? Queries are logical tests that we can perform on the Revit model to extract specific types of information. We can query elements that are certain names, certain families or types, in certain views or sheets, and so on. In our example here, we are going to query the elements by their category, that category being flaws in this instance. To do that, let's start with the query elements component. This component will allow us to query objects with a filter. So let's go into the filter menu. The one we want in this example is the category filter. If we connect that up, nothing will happen. And that's because we need to tell Grasshopper what category we want. You might be tempted to type flaws in a panel and connect it. But if we do that, you'll see that Grasshopper doesn't like this. That's because it needs a category object, which is a specific data type in Rhino inside Revit. There are a couple of ways that we can input this category object. First, we can right click the category input and select model and select floors. The query has now been executed, but we can't see any objects in Grasshopper. The query elements component does not have a preview function. This is because queries can result in hundreds or even thousands of objects and displaying these graphically can really slow down Rhino inside Revit's performance. To have these flaws show in Rhino, we can feed the elements into a graphical element component, which we can find in the Revit tab in the Param menu. That will then execute the script, and now we can see all the flaws in the project have been brought into Grasshopper. This can be good if you need to be quick, but it limits you to one selection. Let's copy these components and show an alternative method for referencing categories. There are several ways we can reference multiple categories, but one common technique to use is the built-in categories component, which can be found under the object styles menu in the Revit panel. This component is a pick list input, which allows us to search for and click multiple categories at once by clicking the control key. Let's select windows and walls. And now we can see that the selection is getting both the wall and window objects. We can get really granular with our filters. 
Let's say I want to select the furniture, but only the ones on the ground floor. We can actually combine filters together to do this. So let's grab the levels filter. This will select objects on the levels that I specify. Under the input tab, select the levels picker component and select level one, which is the ground floor in this model. Great, now we have a list of all the elements on the ground floor. We can now combine the filters using the logical and filter component to join these two tests together and feed both of them into the query elements node. We now have a filter that combines both rules which we can use as the input for a query elements component. To visualize the result, we will need another graphical elements container, which I will just copy from the canvas here. The good thing about using filters is that the selection is dynamic, meaning that if I update the selection criteria or add or remove elements to the model, the changes will be reflected in Grasshopper as well. Okay, so now that we've talked a bit about getting Revit elements into Rhino and Grasshopper, let's talk a bit about how we can go from Rhino to Revit. This is where things get really exciting, as we can now start leveraging freeform modeling, data-driven workflows inside of Rhino and Grasshopper and applying these to our Revit model. In the sample files, you'll find a Rhino model for this chapter. It contains a Rhino version of the Revit model that you see on screen and some geometry, which we will transfer into Revit. There are a couple of different ways to transfer Rhino objects into Revit. Each has their own advantages and disadvantages. Let's start with the most basic method of converting geometry. To do this, we'll use a direct shape. If you notice in the toolbar at the top of the Revit tab, there is a menu called direct shape. Let's talk a bit about direct shapes. Direct shapes are 3D geometry elements in Revit. They are typically reserved for complex geometries that Revit has a hard time creating natively, or to save time creating complex families. We can assign them to a certain category, give them a material, a name, and so on. Most BIM managers do not like to use them, and there are some good reasons for that. Firstly, they can bloat the file size of your Revit model. Secondly, they are not very editable once in the Revit environment. We can't modify their shape, change their material, and so on. That information is baked into the direct shape geometry at the time it is created. However, direct shapes may still be a good option for early stage design development when you are testing ideas. And as you'll see, they are very easy to create with Rhino inside. So let's go ahead and create one. In this Rhino model here, I have this object which represents a roof structure I'd like to put over the patio here inside of the Revit model. Under the direct shape menu, click add direct shape, brep. This component takes only one input, which is the brep geometry. I'm just going to select these and bring them into Grasshopper as breps. So let's feed that in. And just like that, we can see that a transaction has been executed and the geometry is now in Revit. If we go into Revit now and click on this object, you'll see that it's pretty basic. It doesn't have a category or any material information, for example. So let's delete this component and try another direct shape component instead. When we delete this component, Revit will show a warning telling us that the element is no longer tracked. This basically means that Grasshopper has been disassociated from this object in Revit. Click delete all to delete this object and remove the warning. We'll come back to element tracking in just a moment. This time, we're going to use the add direct shape geometry component. We need to give this component a few things. First is our geometry. We have that right here. Second is a category. I'm going to go and right click and assign this to the roof category. Okay, so the geometry has been created in Revit and we can see that it's a roof category. But you'll see we don't have much control from here. It's not a native Revit roof that we can modify, and there's no material, for example. To add a material to this object, we will need to do that inside of Grasshopper. We can add a material by giving this component a material input. Materials, like categories, are a special kind of object in Revit. We can get to materials by going to the Param tab and selecting a material using the material container component. Once we do that, the direct shape will update with material information. 
So as you can see, it's really quick and easy to get direct shapes into Revit, but they do have some downsides in that they are hard to edit and they are not native Revit elements like walls, roofs, floors, etc. Let's look at another method to create Revit geometry. This time we are going to use Grasshopper to create native Revit elements. Wherever possible, this is the method that I use on my BIM projects because it yields outputs that are identical to creating these objects with Revit tools like walls, floors, beams, roofs, etc. This approach maximizes compatibility with Revit and allows for elements to be modified after creation, seamlessly within the Revit environment. However, it does require a bit more thought and requires the Rhino model to be set up in a certain way. It's certainly not as fast as direct shapes. Each type of category will require a slightly different approach and different component to create. For example, creating a wall requires a line, a floor requires a closed curve, a family requires a point. So this time, let's create our roof element as a native Revit roof and compare it with the direct shape method. To do this, I'm going to use the add roof component. Let's have a look at the inputs. It's asking for a curve, a roof type, and a level. Let's start with levels. This time, let's right click and select level 2 as the input. For the roof type, I'm just going to select one by right clicking the input. This will bring up a menu where we can select a specific roof type. Using the drop down menu, select model, roof, and select a roof type from the list here. Unlike direct shapes, we need to use curves as our input instead of breps. There is an outline to this roof form on a separate layer called roof curves in the Rhino model. I'm going to use these curves and reference them into Grasshopper. For floors, ceilings, and roofs, these curves need to be closed curves made up of lines and arcs. Once we feed that in, you'll see our roof form is created inside of Revit. So, how is this different from a direct shape? Well, clicking on this object, we can see that it is a roof category. But because it's a native Revit roof, we can modify it very easily in Revit. For example, we can change the type of the roof. We can modify the extents of it inside of Revit, and so on. I'm just going to undo this and repin this object. Now, in either workflow, the connection between Rhino and Revit is live. If I modify the input curves inside of Rhino, the script will recalculate and update the roof form. By default, Rhino inside components are set to update elements created in Revit whenever a calculation occurs. You may or may not want this to occur. Fortunately, Rhino inside has a method of modifying this behavior. The way that Grasshopper remembers the previous creation is a concept called element tracking. And we can adjust this for each transactional component according to our preferences. To do this, go to any transactional component. A reminder, transactional components are black components like this add roof component here. Right click the output section and select tracking mode. This will bring up three options. By default, it will be set to enabled update. This is the behavior we just saw, which will override the previous element with a new one. Enabled replace is similar in that it will update geometry. However, the difference is that it provides a new element ID, which in practical terms is like deleting the old object and recreating it rather than modifying the existing element. This can cause some things in Revit to disassociate, for example, tags and dimensions. The last option is disabled. Selecting this will modify the graphics of the component to show that it is no longer tracking. When tracking is disabled, you essentially tell Grasshopper not to remember the objects it has created or modified, meaning that each time the script runs, it will create a new object. This can be dangerous because it is very easy to end up with lots and lots of duplicate geometry, and it's harder to edit the Revit elements, but it is sometimes necessary for certain workflows. As a general rule, I like to keep tracking mode set to enabled update. In this case, instead of disabling element tracking, a better option would be to reference both curves at once, which preserves editability. As a final note on transactional components generally, try to get into the habit of disabling these black transactional components in Grasshopper while working. This will ensure you only enable them when you want to update the Revit model.
Hopefully this gives you a better understanding of how you can bridge the gap between your conceptual designs in Rhino and your realized BIM models in Revit. If you want to keep learning, check out some of our other tutorials on this Rhino Inside Revit training course available on thedifferentdesign.com and follow the link below.